Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. That was interesting. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Appreciate the presence of the Lord. Amen. Thank God. Hope everyone had a great uh, Christmas day with your family and friends. And it continues for some of us, amen, just another one or two more to get through, but praise God. He has come, hallelujah, the Lord, amen, in flesh, praise God. And now he dwells within each and every one of us. He's born again and again and again every time someone receives the truth of God in Christ, amen. It's exciting, and it is an exciting time to live. Amen. Uh, it's, you know, I don't think you could have excitement without a little bit of anxiety or kind of uncomfortableness, you know what I mean? So uh, it's okay we don't understand and know everything that's going to take place. We know that the Lord is going to be involved in the, mid, in the midst of it, amen, and he's going to be with us to take us through. And, uh, you know, the, the worst thing that can happen is the best thing that can happen. Praise the Lord. So, amen. No matter what happens, we come out winners. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, thank you again for being here this morning. Thanks for sharing uh, your testimonies and uh, words from the Lord. And appreciate your prayer requests. And we stand in agreement with you. Thank you, those of you that are joining us on Facebook and on uh, the Internet, wherever you might be around the world and here in the United States. Uh, I, I would mention, too, I didn't say anything uh, when we were in prayer, but I, I, we, Sally had heard from Don and Darlene, and she said they are improving, they're doing better. And so, uh, praise the Lord, everybody's, you know, we're going through some stuff, but that's, the, the thing is, we're going through it. Praise the Lord, we're not staying, we're not hanging out, we're just, we're going to get past it. Praise the Lord. So thank the Lord, and thank you again for everybody that's joining us, uh, amen, wherever you are and, and whatever uh, method you're using to be with us. We appreciate it. And uh, amen. We're all one in Christ. Hallelujah. And uh, we've got an exciting year ahead of us. I, I wanted to say something to Suzanne. I'm not uh, speaking out of turn here, but I hope that uh, next Sunday we can have communion to kind of start the year off right. I know they were stocked up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Mike and Suzanne hit the jackpot there and brought a, we've got a bunch of uh, the elements, amen, for communion. So I think it would be a good way to start off the the first service of the new year and uh, just go from there. Praise the Lord. God's got some tremendous things in store for us in this new year. And I do think, you know, God never does anything without preparing us. So last year was a mess in a lot of ways. Uh, but I think it was preparation. It, it was just to get us uh, kind of in the right frame of mind for what's to come and to not be fearful. Uh, a lot, of, All of us have gone through some stuff. And uh, things that uh, can be depressing and uh, frightening and all the rest of it. But we went through it. And it got, what God has shown us is uh, he's going to be with us no matter how it looks, no matter what it's like at the moment. There's a positive end to this. Amen. And all we have to do is stand in faith and God's going to make it happen. Praise the Lord. So unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Aren't you glad? The government is really on his, God help us if the government is where we thought it was, praise the Lord. But it's on his shoulders, and uh, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, praise the Lord. Amen. All of that and so much more is our Lord and our God. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get into the Word of God this morning. We went late last week, and... Uh, it's not unusual, but I'm going to try to be a little briefer this week uh, to get you out of here, and you can go home and finish up the uh, uh, Christmas dinner uh, leftovers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They're good. They're, they're good leftover. Amen. They're good the next day and the next day. Hallelujah. So anyway, God is good, and uh, I want to talk to you about it. I'm so grateful for the things that you guys shared because uh, it is, you're going to see that it is exactly what the Lord is uh speaking to me about and what I want to share with you this morning. It's not unique to me, amen, but uh, 
Praise the Lord. It is unique to the Lord. Hallelujah. So Revelation chapter uh, 19, and I want to read verses 11 through 13. We'll have uh, th- several scriptures here to begin with, and then we'll move on through that. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had that name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Praise the Lord. So uh, Hebrews 6, chapter 12 through 15. I think it's interesting, too, that scripture, uh, and another scripture in uh, Revelation, I I don't remember, I think it's Revelation 12, but anyway, it says that we are overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. If that doesn't identify with that scripture, I don't know how you could miss it, praise the Lord. But uh, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience, everybody say patience, Patience. through faith and patience, they go one and one, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other probably, at least I've never been able to. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abram, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. I don't want to scare anybody, but I think this is talking about 2021. Praise the Lord. If thou hast run with the footmen and they've wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusteth, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Praise the Lord. (laughs) Hallelujah. To me, that's exciting. Because God's telling us, it's going to take more than you, but you'll do it. Amen. If you don't give up, if you or patiently, and you endure, you're going to get the promise. You're going to see the manifestation of everything God has said to us and declared be, uh, us to be. Amen? So let's, uh, uh, Revelation 5 and 1, and we'll get into this. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now that word book, and this throughout Revelation, it's, true, it's actually true of, of, of all the scripture. It's speaking of scrolls. Because obviously they didn't have books when this was written. It was scrolls. And, and the word of God is, uh, you know, it's, it's without, uh, if we saw it in its original form, it's just, it's actually literally called continuous writing. No chapters, no verses, no paragraphs. It's just continuous writing and that's the scrolls that's what was on these scrolls and so he here he is in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book or a scroll written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals now here's what's interesting the word of God in its original form on the scrolls the writing the words the letters is continuous but that's only half this is (laughs) <laughs> it was interesting what uh, Suzanne was saying. Uh, I wanted to say hallelujah and praise the Lord sometimes because I know where I'm going, even if they don't yet. Amen. But that's only half. What's written, the words, the letters, the continuous writing, that's only half. That's just the black. That's just the ink. It's not the rest of it. The white is the background. If, I, if this was all black, you wouldn't see anything but black. It's the white background that makes the black stand out so you can read it, right? Well, the white is the background. It's, the black is only holy. It is holy, amen, but so is the white because without it, you wouldn't see the black, amen? So without white, you wouldn't see the black or you wouldn't see the ink. You wouldn't see the writing. 
There wouldn't be anything to contrast it with. There would be nothing to cause it to stand out. Without the white, you wouldn't see the Word of God. Amen? The white is the unscripture of God. Example, Jesus, He said He sent His Word and healed us. And Jesus is the Word, and by His stripes we were healed. There had to be something to contrast that word with. Amen? When the word is sent into the world, it has to have a context. Amen? It has to have a paper. It has to have a voice. It has to have some medium in order to reveal and manifest itself to the world. Look at Psalms 119, 11 through 13. Psalms 119, 11 through 13. This is about us, not in an egotistical, vain way, but in the way God intended it to be, that we would be the manifestation of God in this earth, that we would be heirs, fellow heirs, joint heirs with Jesus, that we would function as he did in this world in order for God and for his word to be revealed. Amen? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgment of, of thy mouth, of my mouth, of thy mouth, excuse me. This fella in, in the Chicago, they don't care about him. They don't hate him. They hate the word. They hate the, this, the truth. They hate the, the power and the uh, truth of what's behind it. They, all they know is lies. All they know is darkness. And when light and truth comes... It freaks them out. It's like being in a dark room for uh, two or three days and then have somebody turn a spotlight in your face. It's not comfortable. It, it bothers you. Amen? And so the unscripture, the unscripture is your life. Amen? Your life is the white that the word is revealed on or manifest through. Look at Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So the key is to connect your life, your heart, your emotions, your will, amen, your soul, your mind, to the Word of God. Amen? To join the black with the white. Amen? The ink with the scroll. The writing with the paper. In order to manifest it to the world, we have to let our life be the unscripture of God. We have to be the thing that it's written on or the thing that exposes it. Does that make sense? Praise the Lord. Matthew 5.48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Really? That sounds like quite a demand. Sounds like something that would happen when we get to heaven, doesn't it? But he's, telling, he's talking to us now. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, here's the thing. The word of God, it's eternal. It's timeless. It doesn't know time. It's just, it's just like God. You can't separate it from God. It's eternal. It's, it is God. 
right? And in the original Hebrew in which this was written, whatever happens knows no time. It, how could it if it was eternal? It doesn't, it doesn't relate to time. It doesn't know time. Well, you say, well, the Bible talks about time all the time. It talks about days, talks about years, births, deaths, all these kind of things, right? That's true. But the Hebrew language, and this is what's so interesting about it is, it has no absolute tense concerning, concerning time. So how can a language have no past, present, or future? It has other tenses. Tenses that are used and understood or taken to mean the past, present, or future. And that, the truth is, the other tenses don't have any absolutes. They have no real relation to when they occur, these other tenses that I'm talking about. In fact, at times, the scripture speaks of the future events as if they were something that had already happened, right? right? The future past. I mean, we read it sometimes from the Western perspective, and it can just really blow your brain if you don't try to get it into context or figure out, okay, find another scripture here that I can match this up with to make some sense out of it, right? In Hebrew, the scriptures, the tenses used are actually not past, present, and future, but perfect and imperfect. We were, we were taught this in, in English, you know, we probably didn't pay any attention, but we were taught it anyway, because we were more interested in the past, present, and the future. But there is the tenses, and that's how Hebrew is written. It's, it's written in the, in the perfect and the imperfect tenses, not in past, present, and future. Amen? The perfect tense refers to an action that's finished, and so it's complete. That's perfect. And the imperfect tense speaks of an action that's unfinished, and so incomplete or imperfect. So in Hebrew, you only get two choices. You live in the perfect, or you live in the imperfect. And if you live always striving, and here you'll see what, we're, what we've struggled with because of this, what seems to be just a simple, you know, grammatical way of looking at things, God doesn't do anything by happenstance. Amen? So if you live always striving to finish what's unfinished, to complete what's incomplete, if you live trying to be saved, trying to be loved by God, trying to be good enough, trying to be worthy enough, trying to be healed, trying to be victorious, trying to be more than an overcomer, trying to be set free, trying to be, uh, you know, complete, then you're living in the imperfect tense. You're living in imperfection. And living in the imperfect tense never works because whatever comes out of incompletion can never be anything but incomplete. <laughs> and we live most of our, many Christians live their whole, time, whole life this way. Yeah. See, to be, in, to be the manifestation of Scripture, to be the unscripture, you might say, to be the Word, the perfect tense, we've got to learn to live from what is already completed. To do from what is already done. A triumph from a victory that's already won. And that is the word and the work of God. That is scripture. Salvation, healing, wholeness, the completed work of Jesus, right? Shalom, sozo. It's finished. What's perfect is what's finished. Yeah. Yeah. Salvation is a perfect work. Amen? And to live in it, we have to live in days of future past. 
We have to live in the perfect tense. Not in the past, present, or future tense, but in the perfect tense, which is future past, which is we are what he said we are. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. That one scripture alone ought to change our understanding of past, present, and future. It's called eternity. It's not about those types of tenses. It's about either being complete or being incomplete, either being perfect or imperfect. He's made us perfect, but we live our lives imperfectly, incompletely, because we're living from a Western mindset. We're living from a, from a non-biblical viewpoint. They overcame by the word of his testimony and the blood of the lamb, the, the finished work. That's what that is. Praise the Lord. Look at this, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 19. 1 Kings 19 and 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but that would freak me out if Elijah just happened to be strolling past and this great prophet, and they knew who he was, they knew the, the power that he had uh, with God, and have him throw his mantle on me as if to expect that I'm going to somehow respond? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31, we're still talking about this imperfect and perfect, the, the uh, complete and the incomplete, all right? Us being the unscripture or the manifestation of scripture, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called. I'm feeling better about myself already. Praise the Lord. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen? So again, imagine being Elisha and feeling Elijah's mantle coming over you. Praise the Lord. He had to have felt inadequate. But so did all the others who received their mantles. Whether it was Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the way to Peter. They all felt unworthy. And for good reason. The mantle was too big. The mantle was too much. It didn't fit. But that's the nature of the mantle. In Hebrew, the mantle is called adoret. It means large, big, great, wide, powerful, excellent, noble, mighty, glorious. I don't find myself in any of that. But let's go back to Jeremiah 12 and verse 5 again. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? I think these are rhetorical questions. I think what he's saying is if you were doing this and you found it really difficult to just keep up when things were going pretty decent, then how do you expect to run or contend with the horses? If in your natural you, you, had, you struggled with things being just not that great, but right? What 
do you think is going to happen when the crap really hits the fan? And if the land of peace, I mean, just think for a moment. Yeah, it's been chaotic, and it's been like a war going on here with the riots and the looting and all the other junk and the craziness going on from our government. But, the, but transfer yourself to Afghanistan, right, or, or to North Korea where people are being murdered and butchered by, you know, every day, and we never hear any, anything about it, but we know that it's happening all the time. And many, many times because of their faith, because of their belief in Christ. So we think, you know, I'm saying by all worldly standards, we've been in peace. And if we can't handle that, how are we going to handle the real warfare? Wherein thou trusteth thy wearied thee, then how wilt thou do at the swelling of Jordan? Well, look at Philippians 4, 13. And it's the only way. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Verse 19. My God shall supply all my needs whatever I need, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that doesn't just mean my wallet. That means my strength. That means my ability to interpret a dream. My ability to, to witness to somebody or to share or to, to have a word of knowledge. or You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm talking about us. I'm not saying me. I got all this. I'm saying He can supply that. Wherever the need is, He can f- meet that need. That's, again, what I'm talking about. We're going to find out what real grace is. And I'm not saying that isn't grace that we've experienced, and thank God for it, and I think it was a preparation for where he was taking us to get us to the place where we recognize that we are this unscripture, that we are the manifestation of the Word of God. And it's not based on us, but on the mantle that has been placed on us. Amen? The mantle's bigger. Amen? It's greater than the one that it's given to. That's what these scriptures are telling us. He takes the foolish things. He takes the nobodies and the nothings, and he puts this mantle on them that go, we go, what? It can't be. This is the, you, you, you hit the wrong guy. You, you, you must have been aiming for somebody next to me, and, and it fell on me by accident. It's true for every one of us. Each one of us has been given God's word. We've been given an adoret, a mantle, a calling. But remember, the adoret always speaks of greatness. So your calling will likewise be too big for you. It won't fit you. It won't match who you are. That's why it takes faith. That's why it takes patience. That's why it takes submission. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, of the Word. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, he's not talking about preachers here. He's talking about ministering or doing the Word. So, ministers of the Word of God or doers of the Word. Not of the letter, but the Spirit. Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We have to live this thing out. We can't just declare it. We can't just say it. We have to, by the Spirit, we have to walk it out. That's how it has an impact. That's how it has the effect that it's supposed to have. That's the mantle. Amen? The Spirit gives life. See, we we struggle with comparisons. Comparisons to the mantle or to the Word and to who we are. But it'll always be greater. It'll always be more powerful. It'll always be more noble. It'll always be more excellent. It'll always be more glorious than the one who wears it. 
to the one. It'll always be greater than the one who it's given to. But it's because it's not meant to fit who you are. It's meant to fit who he says you are. Who he has declared you to be. The spirit man. It's meant to fit who you're to become. Who you are to manifest. Who you are in Christ. Who you are in the word of God. Your mantle has to be beyond you or you'll not get anything done. Or we'll be stuck in 2021 forever. The good news is you can rise to it because it you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can increase into it. The increase of his government knows no end. What is, what is government? Well, we know what it thinks it is. It thinks it's a bunch of fat cats sitting in Washington doing absolutely nothing but spending our money. But government is the people, of the people, for the people, by the people. The government is a manifestation, supposed to be a manifestation of the people. And that's why we're so, so angry and so frustrated because this government isn't manifesting anything of me. It isn't showing me anything about me. It's just throwing some crap at me and telling me I have to accept it. But it's not me. It isn't what I believe. It isn't what I stand for. It isn't what I would want. It isn't what I think is right. But the government, the government, the government, the people are upon his shoulders. And he gives the increase. Because in Christ we can do all things. There's no limit. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 13. I'm, and I'm... I wasn't lying. I'm going to be done here just briefly, really quick. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 13. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You understand what he's saying? So he's given us grace. In other words, he's given us the ability to operate in the measure of Christ or the gift of Christ, which is Jesus, which is the word. He's given us the grace to do this. To, to be able to accomplish what we're talking about here. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. The gifts he gave us were, was the word of God, the, the finished work, right? The perfect. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, meaning he, he defeated the enemy, right? He that descended is the same also that ascended, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Complete. That's the tense he's trying to get us into. Yeah. Unto the measure, the stature, of the fullness of Christ. Yeah, we are complete in him. We are finished in him. We are who we are, who we are supposed to be, who he declares us to be, who he created us to be in Christ. Yeah. And he says we are that by the word of God. Look, don't be discouraged in the difference in size between Jesus and you. It has to be that way. Between the mantle and the one wearing the mantle. And it's so that we can become greater. It's so we can become more excellent, more noble, more powerful, more glorious than we were. So that we can receive the eteret, 
so that we can receive the mantle and operate in the mantle. Not of ourselves, but of the anointing, of the power, of the finished work, of, of the perfect work of God. Because that's who God says you are. And he spoke it before you were. Praise the Lord. We are the unscripture. We are the only way for the word to be seen. And that's what God chose. He said, you'll do it by my mantle or it won't get done. Somebody is going to have to receive the mantle. It doesn't make you arrogant. It doesn't make you egotistical. It actually proves your humility. Because you're saying, it's the only way it can be done. But he said, in the mind of God, it's already done. We have reached the past tense in the Western mindset. We are in the perfect tense. We are in the complete tense. And unless we operate from there, we'll forever be incomplete. We'll forever be in imperfect. And I'm telling you, that's the church. The church has been trying to live in a Western set of tenses, which has kept us forever in the, in the mind of God, in the imperfect, in the incomplete, in the always striving to get to that place that God says, you're already there. We just got to get our mind renewed to the truth of his word. Let me, I'll just, and I'll close with this that I already talked about at the very beginning, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the finished work, and the word of their testimony, which is the word of God. And as Don said, they love not their lives unto death. Because this ain't us anyhow. This is just the vehicle. This is just what carries the mantle. And we, if we put too much emphasis on this, we will not love our lives unto death. We'll love them unto life and only life. And that's what makes us fearful. Afraid to die. No, you're already dead. And your life is hid in Christ. Yeah. Right? I mean, we just, we're looking at this thing backwards. We're looking at future, present, past. And he's just saying it's either incomplete or it's complete. It's either imperfect or it's perfect. It's either flesh or it's spirit. You're either in Christ or you're in you. He says we're in Christ. It's time for us to start living that way. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We're in the time that this is happening. Listen, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be getting the, the understandings that we have of Scripture, uh, whether it's grace, whether it's the things that he's been leading us down this path. And we didn't know that when, when we first hear these different things and different people preaching it, and then we kind of picking up and, and looking and searching and finding things. We didn't know. We thought this is about us. It's about now. No, it's about something that's finished. And you finding yourself there, recognizing yourself in that finished work, in that perfect work. Amen? Let's do this. Let, let's think the way God thinks. Let's, let's forget this past, present, future stuff, and let's live in the perfect, in the completed work of Jesus. And watch what God will do supernaturally through these base creatures, <laughs> right? Through, through these, you know, the weak, the foolish. Let's confound those that are living in the past, present, and future with perfection. Amen? Show them who God really is and what he's capable of. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. This is more, about, more than about Jesus being born into this world. This is about us recognizing he's been born into us. And we are new creations in Christ. Amen?
Glory to God. Let's walk in this. Amen. Keep reminding yourself every time yourself tries to tell you the opposite of this, give them a heads up. You're talking to perfection here, buddy. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus. Amen. Have a great happy new year. Be safe, and we'll see you back here Sunday.